Are you all right? The concerned cry of the distraught woman's nurse bounced off the hard surface of the metal wall. Are you sick? Can you open the door? My head hurts, the injured woman wailed. Open the door for me, please, the island girl pleaded. Her distressed face appeared in the gap under the door. The sobbing woman complied, reaching her hand out unsteadily and unlatching the hook. I'm okay, I reckon. I stood up too fast, she assured both of the women who were gaping at her in concern. Shame replaced panic at that moment because she had lost control and her allowed herself to be weak. The island girl helped her to rise solicitously and the other woman returned to dressing the child whose solemn brown eyes followed the grown-ups as though he was wise beyond his years. I think I need to sit down, the injured woman lamented to her nurse companion as the two women wended their way back to the dining room. You should go back to bed and try to sleep for a while, the island girl insisted. No, came the sharp report. I don't want to sleep anymore. I just want a quiet place where I can sit down and put my head back together. Decide what to do. Do you know anywhere like that? I don't know, the girl responded. Maybe. Hand in hand, the two walked down a dimly lit hallway past carts filled with clean bedding and into a small room. It was full of boxes stacked neatly on the floor and shelves lined with more boxes. The room also had a metal desk and several padded chairs, as if it were doubled as an office of some sort. No one will be coming in here till the day workers come, the girl said as she motioned to a chair. We can sit here for a little while. You know this hotel real good, the woman said. Yes, I work here, the girl answered. Oh, she acknowledged with a nod. With no more energy left to continue the conversation, the refugee from the storm leaned her head back against the wall and closed her eyes, exhausted from her trip to the bathroom. She felt unbelievably tired and weak after her short trek, as if she had climbed a steep hill instead of merely walking down a hall. It occurred to her that perhaps she should have gone back to the cot Still, she did not want to sleep again. Her last sleep had been a nightmare, and she did not want to return of that. She wanted to piece everything together and remember where she was and why she was here. She needed to be awake and alert for that task. Were you all here when I came in? The woman asked her companion after a short interval of silence between them. Yes, the girl answered. You were brought in unconscious on a stretcher. This is why I remember you. They were going to try to get you through to the hospital in town. Then after the doctor examined you, he thought you were only suffering from a concussion from the blow to your head because you were responding at time. So it was decided it was better to keep you where you were. I was responding how? The woman asked in surprise. You spoke to us at times, the girl answered. I don't remember any of that, she responded. It will come back soon. You're still in shock, the girl assured her soothingly. I hope so, the woman replied. Some of the hospital people and city officials are upstairs sleeping now, but soon you can tell them who you are and they can help to find your family for you. I know you are worried but don't be. They are good at this, I promise you, the girl said confidently. They'll need to be, the woman responded morosely. Oh, it is easier than you think, the girl went on. All of the tourists are registered into the country by their passports. It is our industry here and our system is very good. Who comes, who goes? No one can get lost. It would create a national interest incident and no more tourists for our island. This last sentence was accompanied with a chuckle of laughter. Why do you all think I'm a tourist? The woman asked Curly. 
you're American, I can tell that. We get a lot of Americans here, the girl answered. How come you're so sure, the woman persisted. Your accent, the way you talk. Yuns don't have any Americans living here, she countered. Yes, lots of them, but you're not a local. If you are, you have not here for, lived here for very long, the girl replied evasively. Looking at this young and pretty good Samaritan, the woman wondered for the first time what the girl's name was. I don't even know your name, she remarked. Peta, the girl replied with a warm smile. Peta Cheval, and what are you called, sister? She prompted. At that question, the conversation between the two became an awkward silence. Finally, the woman answered with a slow negative movement of confusion, wincing in pain with the effort it took to try to remember. She raised her hand to her head, rubbing at the ache that had not stopped its throbbing since she woke up in this strange place. I don't know, she admitted. I can't think right now. My head hurts too much. You should lie down, Ada insisted, noting her patient's distress. No, the suggestion was forcibly rejected again. I want to think, and maybe if you all can give me an aspirin, I could. I can't do that, the girl called Peta apologized regretfully. You can't have anything unless the doctors give it to you. You were hurt bad, sister. I'm sad for you, but I would not do you harm. My man will know how to help you, she added decisively. My man, who's that? My mother, the girl answered. She is sleeping, but she wakes up early, and she will want to go see if the house was hurt. We'll go and get her. The woman was pulled off the chair gently, and she meekly followed her new friend back down the corridor. Her hope was that this mother would have some pity on her and let her have some aspirin for her pain. How much harm could that do, she asked herself bitterly. At this point, nothing could make her feel any worse. During their absence, a small number of refugees had roused from their uncomfortable slumbers. Peta led her patient to a group of women of varying ages with an assortment of sleeping children. The two maneuvered their way around floor pallets of sleeping people, making a concerted path towards Peta's family members. One of the older women approached from the group and spoke directly to Peter in a hushed but heavy island accent. Reno be here, we gone now, I be old and useless for help. The woman, she assumed was Peta's mother, looked anything but old and useless. She was a thin woman, slightly taller than her daughter. Standing next to the two island women, the storm refugee felt tall indeed, because there was almost a head of difference in height between them. The older woman's gray hair was down back tightly in a colorful cloth scarf that gave her small, finely boned head a classic proud look. And she held herself upright with the grace of a dancer. Her pale copper skin was as unlined as a young woman's, and the look in her faded brown eyes was shrewd. There was a strength and a vitality about this woman that would instinctively send you to her if you were in trouble. You are leaving? Peta asked her mother. She turned troubled eyes to her newfound friend who was looking perplexed. I am staying till Trina comes, the youngest of the women holding one of the smaller of the children spoke up. My man is taking Lily and Covey. You come, my man Cheval spoke authoritatively to her daughter. Renault be wanting you. Can I go with y'all, the injured woman interjected into the conversation. The plea was directed to the older woman who was definitely in charge of all these people. She was certain that this was a chance to get out of her present situation and impulsively seized on the opportunity. To give her credit, the older woman did not so much as blink an eye in surprise as she perused the speaker with a sphinx-like stare. 
but Peta's eyes widened in amazement at the bold request. Is it too much to ask? The woman pleaded, focusing her gaze on the immobile woman in front of her. Just for a day, she added, I won't be a speck of trouble, and I swear on Bible, I'll keep, I'll earn my keep. You should stay and get the doctors to look at your head, Peta insisted. I feel okay now. I do. And I want to get out of here. I'm just one more body here. I'm okay. I can take care of myself. I sure can, the injured woman insisted. The words were more positive than the woman actually felt, and she spoke softly because of the sleeping children. Nevertheless, she persevered earnestly endeavoring to persuade the mother of the island girl who had befriended her to allow her to accompany the group. She desperately wanted to leave the, this place that seemed more like a strange prison to her than a place of refuge. You come, Peta's mother said kindly, pointing in her direction with her long slender finger. The degree had been made and a toddler was plucked from his mother's arms by Peta's mother. Also, a sleepy little girl laying on a pallet with two other black curly heads, identical to hers, was roused by another young woman in the group. Anxious to help the new, the new member of the entourage reach to take a diaper bag that had been placed at my man's feet. However, Peta forestalled the move and draped it over her own shoulder. Feeling a sense of profound relief, the woman followed the treating backs of her benefactors without looking back. A young man bounding from a mud-spattered jeep-styled truck to help them with the children was definitely a relation to Peta. He had the same luminous black eyes and ready smile, the same long, dark, kinky curls framing the same round face. In fact, if it wasn't for the dark goatee on his chin, he could have been her clone. The group boarded without any comment from the young man about the newcomer's presence. The entire group fitted themselves snugly into the vehicle. The little girl, Lily, was placed beside the injured woman in the small back seat surrounded by several bags of what looked like supplies and clothes. In the front seat in Peta's lap, the child who had been taken from her mother fretted restlessly. Feeling so much like excess baggage because of the small interior of the trunk, the refugee from the storm was nevertheless thankful to be liberated from her plight at the hotel. Leaning back against the seat, she turned her attention to the passing scenery. The morning was spectacularly beautiful and the air fresh and fragrant. One would have thought this was a normal day in paradise. However, the telltale signs of the storm were very evident. It was a sobering spectacle to view as the driver made his way with the ease of a four-wheel drive around large limbs blocking access to main roads. Vegetation was uprooted and the debris of wood and objects of civilization were strewn in heaps as if some naughty child had thrown a temper tantrum and wrecked his room. There were numerous overturned cars looking like oversized toys thrown aside after play. They passed a bulldozer already at work on a collapsed uh, house. The thought made the survivor of this de devastation realize that the Cheval family must be very concerned about the condition of their own home. She said a silent prayer for them that they had been spared. It was then that her thoughts turned to wonder about her own home. Where did she fit in in this picture? Did she live on this island, or was she a tourist, as Peta had suggested? Her forehead began to throb again with pain, and she clutched her aching skull. Too late, she realized she had forgotten to ask Peta's mother for that aspirin.